The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is unprotected attack paths that allow threats to compromise vulnerable targets in the cloud and data center. But traditional micro-segmentation is too complex and time-consuming. There's a better approach. Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation, delivering results immediately with a security outcome that's provable and management that's zero touch. Driven by machine learning, Edgewise automatically builds policies that protect any application in any cloud without any changes to your network. They provide measurable improvement by quantifying attack path risk reduction and verifying software identity before it communicates to stop application compromises and data breaches. To see how to eliminate your network attack surface, visit securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. Qualys is introducing a new prescription for security, and it's free. Global IT Asset Discovery and Inventory. Activate it today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys so you can achieve 100% near real-time visibility across your hybrid environments. Welcome to Security Weekly. I'm your host, Matt Alderman. We are recording live from DEF CON 27. We're at the Social Engineer Village, and joining me for this interview is Chris Kirsch. Welcome. Good morning. Hi, how are you doing? Good, I, I'm great. Uh, your talk was on cold reading. Absolutely. And yeah. so we're going to talk cold reading. Yeah. And but but let's start. What what the heck is cold <laughs> reading? <laughs> so cold reading is a technique where you're trying to make other people believe that you have psychic powers, mm. right? So it's uh, I don't claim to have any real psychic powers, um, but these are techniques that have been you know passed down the line, and there are books about this stuff on how you can uh, make people believe that you can predict the future, read their mind, give them advice about their, their life, and so on. Um, yeah. Got it. And now you did a really interesting experiment. Yes. So I, I read a book about cold reading. Um, I, I recommend if anybody wants to get into this, it's uh, Ian Rowland's uh, The Full Facts Book of Cold Reading. It's still available. And he gives a very good overview, right? And, and I read it and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. But then I wanted to try it out. Mm. And it's kind of weird to go to your, you, you could go to your family members and friends and <laughs> so on, right. but I, I already know them pretty well. So I didn't want that to taint right. my experiment, yep, right? right? Okay. But I also didn't quite want to go up to random people on the street and say, hey, I'm a psychic. Can I, can I do <laughs> yeah, a reading for you? Because they'll yeah. think I'm completely nuts, right? So um, what I did is we uh, – I work for Veracode, and uh, they organize uh, three days of hack hackathons twice a year. Okay. So hackathons are different things to different companies. Um, for us, it's a little bit like a – think of it as a mini DEF CON, right? So there's like escape rooms and like this and that and um, – and uh, and you're bringing not, in customers and prospects, or no, no. This is you can work on anything you want. Okay. There's only two rules: so you have to either learn something new, or work with people you haven't worked with before. Okay. So um, the the psychic readings was both. I was learning something new, mm -hmm. and I was working with people that I hadn't met before. Right. And if you've like uh, seen my my uh, pickpocketing talk from from layer eight that I gave, that also started at a hackathon, meeting new people, learning right. new skills. Right. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so I um, advertised that I would do psychic readings. I didn't disclose up front that it was a cold reading, that it was fake, right? Okay. Because that would have uh, influenced the experiment. And a few of my colleagues were looking at me a little bit strange. <laughs> 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 but, you know, I, that was the risk I, I had to take. Right. And uh, so then I did, uh, I think it was like eight readings over the course of two days. It's not a crazy amount, but I actually found it to be extremely draining from like a mental exercise because I had to hold up a conversation and kind of like read a lot of social cues and and process these and think about how do I package those up so that they sound like a psychic reading. Oh. So there's actually a lot going on in the background yeah. because um, I wanted to give kind of custom psychic readings rather than a, a, a stock one, which is also surprisingly effective. You can just write a generic one uh, rehearse it and learn it by heart and then give it to, uh, to everybody in the same and everybody will kind of find their own uh, identity within it, right? Got it. But I wanted to go a step beyond that. So so that was the part that was uh, a little bit more taxing. A little challenging, yeah. yeah because yeah. You're, you're sitting with a person you don't know. Yeah. 
you're having a conversation, you're yeah. processing, trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to make this reading yeah. work and make it believable, yes. right? Yes. Because that's the yeah. trick here yeah. is making it believable where the person sitting on there sounds like, well, how did he know that, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there is, uh, cold reading is not just one technique. It's actually a whole collection of different mm. techniques. And uh, a lot of them are super interesting. And the reason why I wanted to learn about this is, uh, number one, because it's a wacky thing to research. And <laughs> it was really fun. Uh, number two, because I think there's a lot of crossover to uh, social engineering right. and so on. And in my talk, I actually talked about a lot of uh, applications, direct applications for... Well, I was going to ask you the same yeah, question. Yeah. What, how, how do you apply in a social engineering setting? Then? Yeah, yeah. So um, let me go back to you at your earlier question, right? Like how, how did the reading work? Mm -hmm. So... I started out and I uh, asked people, uh, have they had a reading before? I was trying to gauge the... Uh, kind of their experience. Their experience like, yeah. and, and their uh, level of skepticism, okay. right? Because that's really important. So I asked people, so have you had a reading before? And some people might have said like, oh, I did one once and so on. And I'm not quite sure. So those are the maybes. Then there are some people that said like, oh, no, I'd never do that. I'm just doing this for fun. And then uh, there were some people that were kind of like had been going to psychics for 20 years. So wow. I had the full oh, spectrum. Okay. Right? And um, that was really important to me because I needed to know kind of, uh, number one, I, I wanted to make that part of the experiment, like their, their predisposition coming in right. and then how, how they came out and, and how that changed their view. Uh, the skeptic, skeptics were really hard to convert. The maybes mm -hmm. were actually the, the easiest to work with. Um, they could be convinced either way, so it, it was easier to sway them. Yep. And the hardcore believers kind of fell into two camps. Some of them uh, uh, said like, hey, I don't believe you have psychic powers and <laughs> you need to, or like, you need to train a little bit more kind of thing, <laughs> right? Uh, and that was fine, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and I was doing this for the first time. I, I'm, right. I don't claim to be like a professional yeah. psychic. They were telling you to hone your skills. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was uh, one person who, even after I told her that I didn't have psychic powers and revealed the methods that I used, she uh, still said like, oh, but I do believe you have psychic intuition. And she was really into it. I couldn't convince her of the opposite. Wow. So, yeah. Interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. So now how do you apply these techniques to yeah. social engineering then? Great. You know, where does that fit in? Yeah. And, and because I think it's, it's an interesting part to get somebody to believe something. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so how does this, yeah. how do these skills kind of transfer over? Yes, that? sure. So, um, I, I gave you the example earlier of gauging the sitter, right? Yeah. And, uh, let's say you are, uh, doing a wishing call as part of a social engineering exercise and you're trying to figure out um, uh, the, the technical savviness of the person mm -hmm. on the other line, right? right? Because you, you should know that before going in because if they have no technical savviness, you can completely BS the whole conversation right. and they, it, yeah. they'll believe anything. Right. If they have a very high technical skill set, you might have to adjust a little bit, right? right. The, the risk is higher. You have to trade a little bit more careful, carefully. Um, so you could ask as part of the um, as part of the IT support call to say like, hey, um, I'll, I'm going to walk you through this and I'm going to help you through this just so that, that I get a sense for your uh, technical expertise. Are you more of like a regular Out Outlook user mm -hmm. or Office user or do you go into the advanced settings and drop down to, to the command line once right. in a while, right? Yep. So this is kind of like giving them two options and having them self-select uh -huh. and gauging their their savviness right. to go okay. in, right? Mm -hmm. And that gives you a good indication of how to shape the rest of the call. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So using that technique kind of guides you down the yeah. path of getting the information that you want yeah. at the end yeah. of the day, which is credentials or whatever, yeah. right? Exactly. Right. Um, then I had a, uh, I printed out from Google image search some astrological chart. I, d I don't know where it came from. I don't know what it actually does. And I, I printed that out and said, all right, you know, we're going to get started in a moment. And uh, what I would like you to do to start out with is uh, I want you to close your eyes, take a pen, put it on the paper and draw lines across the chart, right? And uh, in any shape or form. And you're done when you're done, right? And that was kind of like in the social engineering world, that was my, my pretext, right? Mm -hmm. I was setting up the why and how, and I told them about like how I'd learned this from, right. my, from my grandmother in Thuringia, <laughs> like she's from <laughs> Eastern Germany and so on. And... Uh, so uh, I also had them write down their date of birth, trace their hand on the other side, and write the initials of somebody of significance uh, to them in on the back. And uh, then, uh, so that was kind of my pretext. Most of that stuff didn't um, have any impact on my reading, hmm. but I was always referring back to it and looking at it <laughs> and so on, right? Uh, the <laughs> Trying to make them believe yeah, that it did. The date of birth and the, and the initials actually did play into some later rounds that we can okay. talk about in a moment. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 
And um, then as a next step, I, uh, I, um, so w what we learn about that for social engineering purposes is, you know, really sell it. Like it, even if your pretext is kind of like a little shaky and it just yeah. came up with it on a whim, right? Uh, really <laughs> just go sell for it. it right? Just yeah. really go for it. And you know, if if you've seen the um, the documentary on 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 the fire festival, you know, like yeah. channel these guys. Uh -huh. Right. Really bad idea, yeah. but boy, did they sell it! Right. They sold it. Yeah. <laughs> All, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They did. Yeah. All the way to the end. And then I would uh, ask people. Uh, um, so if uh, after they told me like have you had a reading before or not mm -hmm. and then let's say they haven't right I would say oh so let me uh, provide my perspective on you know how this works and give you a little bit of an intro yeah. right so the things I I see um, I, I can't quite steer them so we, you know you can ask me for a certain direction but mm -hmm. it's, it you know whatever comes comes right. and uh, it also might not all make sense to me but I need your help to interpret it oh right? I see yeah so. That means, uh, number one, you are setting the, the precedent that, hey, you might be wrong or it might be the right information, but we just didn't interpret it right. Yeah. So you're giving yourself uh, a little out. outs. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, in case. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, um, you're making them do the work, mm. right? You, you're throwing something out there and they're, they have to interpret it. And they're try you actually get them to refine it for you. Exactly, right? Yeah. So in an SE context, uh, let's say you, you are going in completely cold, you've done no, no research on a target. Uh, you might walk into an office and say, hey, um, uh, uh, somebody asked me to, to fix the, the um, cables in one of the meeting rooms and, you know, like, fellow about this tall, nice guy, short, uh, short brown hair. Um, and then somebody else would say, oh, you probably mean Richard, right? So they provide you the information. Right. Um, they're doing the work. Uh, and they've just confirmed to themselves that Richard asked you to go and, right. and uh, oh, check yeah. out the conference room, right? Yeah. So um, you, you try and do the same thing and have them do the work. Got right? it. Yeah. yeah. So you said date of birth mattered yeah. and the initials mattered. How did yeah. that come into your So that script? came in, in a, at a later part. So I... Uh, did one thing where I looked up the three most common first names, both male and female, mm -hmm. for all the decades since like 1970s to the, the 2000s. And I had that on a little cheat sheet. So when they were writing down their date of birth, I looked at their year okay. and then looked at my cheat sheet. And in the, I think it's like the 90s and uh, 2000s, for example, uh, two of the three most common female names are Jess and Jen or mm. Jessica and Jennifer, right? Yeah. So um, if it's a, a woman sitting there, I would pick female names. And if it's a man, usually male names. Right. And then I'd say something like, oh, um, I'm, I'm sensing that there is somebody of significance to you, uh, somebody you haven't been in touch with for a long time. And they, uh, you know, you've thought about reaching out to them and they want to connect back with you. Um, so um, I'm, I'm getting the sense, uh, I'm getting this, the letter J, um, <laughs> Like a Jess or a Jen or a Jessica or Jennifer does does that like who is that person? Right? Yeah, and so you're fishing for that, and uh, about half the time I got a hit on those, right? So you're just playing mm -hmm. with the probabilities, right? And um, when they said no, don't know any Jess, don't know any Jen, I don't know what you're talking about, then you can use an out because a psychic is never wrong, right? <laughs> 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 you can use an out, and you can say, oh. Um, yeah, I, I get a really strong sense that this person has a big influence on your life. And so if they haven't come along yet, then please make sure to look out for them. Oh, I see. So you're yeah. doing a time shift, okay, right? Yeah. You're going from past to future, right? right? Okay. Yeah. So if it wasn't in the past, then it's yeah. somebody that's in the yeah. future. Yeah. Uh, recommendations for anybody on how to use these skills? Because you, you, I think you talked a little bit about recommendations in your talk as well. Yes. Um, so you can use it for SE, right? Um, I have uh, applied some of these things to uh, for salespeople, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes instead of uh, w one thing that's very strong in, in cold reading is don't ask questions but make statements, okay. right? You're coming across a lot more like you actually know the subject matter. And uh, so if, if I'm saying, um, oh, um, and I'm using a random example here, oh, you're... Uh, your AWS bills, are, I hear your AWS bills are very high, right? Uh, either they'll contradict you if it's wrong, right? right? And say, oh, no, I don't think so, uh, that, right? Or they say, oh, yeah, and they think like you already know their company and you okay. know their problems yeah. and so on, Got right? It. 
Yeah. 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 Builds that confidence yeah. with the customer and, and yeah. gives your salespeople a yeah. little more confidence in, yeah. in building a rapport, a relationship yes. with yeah. the customer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. All Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us, and we'll come back soon. Welcome to Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman. We are recording live at DEF CON 27. We're in the Social Engineer Village. Joining me for this interview segment, Micah Zenko. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so you want to talk about non-cyber red teaming. What is non-cyber red teaming? Sure. So most people know of red teaming as like advanced pen testing, which yes. is trying to get to the most valuable thing that someone is trying to protect by emulating a motivated adversary. But red teaming also is applied in a lot of private sector, uh, military, and nonprofit world, which mm -hmm. is essentially doing what are called uh, facilitated brainstorming exercises and crisis management simulations to think through the consequences of your strategy, mm. of your plan, of your processes, because the whole theme of my work is you can't grade your own homework. So just as you don't know the vulnerabilities of a defended system, you don't know the vulnerabilities of your plan. So it's pen testing in a different way, but basically trying to pen test the thinking behind your strategies and plans. Got it. it uh, in So... I was thinking you were going to go down a slightly different path, so I want to throw this out and say, is this also considered non-cyber red teaming? So I worked, first part of my career was nuclear power, and then I, I spent a little bit of time at one of the refineries. And one of the things we had to do was uh, prepare for risks like a hurricane sure. coming up the Gulf um, Coast and hitting New Orleans because BP at the time had a, has a, they have a big uh, refinery down there. And... That's a non-cyber incident, yep. if, when you think about it, right? It's, it's a hurricane. Uh, but if it floods the plant, how do you prepare business continuity, disaster recovery, et cetera? Uh, and when uh, the hurricane hit a few years back, my guess is they pulled out my disaster recovery plan of course. to restore the plant because those systems don't change very often, right? right? Uh, and so when you think about non-cyber red teaming, that's a red team kind of exercise. Think, what happens? What do we do when this happens. It could be an earthquake. It could be a lot of things. You talked about strategy, which I thought was interesting as well, because I think more of the natural disasters when I think about something like that. But I would say yours is red teaming. That's crisis management simulations. Okay. Because every organization has playbooks and runbooks for s all sorts of disasters. Most of them, they don't test. They don't test rigorously. <laughs> and even in the cyber yeah. world, the, the default is go to the CISO and say, what do we do? Most decisions actually have to be elevated to the C-suite level they take on account um, commercial interests, your customer needs, your partners, and it is not a CISO decision. That's like one of the things we do is we force uh, C-suite and board level people to really think about the implications of political uh, um, miscommunications by the CEO. You're, you mm -hmm. have a massive data breach. You have a natural disaster. We've done this with mining companies and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So you turns out, it turns out their playbook isn't very good. And the only way you really test roles and responsibilities and build trust and relationships between people is in actual crisis-like simulations. Got it. Because you don't build trust in crisis and roles and responsibilities go out the window unless you practice them. Yeah, true. You know, I think uh, Jason and I and Paul talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago on Business Security Weekly about the, the roles and responsibilities when there's a crisis between the board and the management team, right? Because the board needs to have oversight and understand what's going on, but they're not the ones no. or shouldn't be the ones that are actively involved in the activity when something happens. And there has to be kind of those liaisons to keep both teams uh, in check. Same would apply here, right? Because right. now I have executives, but I might have line management that is responsible for aspects of that crisis management. There's roles th that vary. And if those aren't structured well and put together and tested, when you're in an actual crisis, it's probably just pure chaos. Boards get quarterly briefings from CISOs that are mandated, and they sit through them like it's a hostage briefing. <laughs> they have no interest in what's being said, and they don't really retain any of the information. The mm -hmm. way boards learn about cyber threats are from peer networks and from news reporting. Yeah. And from software that they hear their friends have bought. That's right. So that's how like incident detection software, that's what they think cyber is. They don't really know what the CISO does or what her mm. concerns are and what the team and the bandwidth is and the attack surface. And uh, I can just tell you in, in situation after situation, you find out that, team, that um, organizations are less well prepared because when the crisis hits, they literally don't know what to tell the marketplace. They don't know mm. what to tell the vendors. Mm. They don't know what to tell third-party law, uh, law enforcement in particular. I mean, like, if you don't have a go bag 
of what you can share with Secret Service or FBI on day one, you are way behind the curve. Mm. The biggest organizations in the United States don't have that today. Interesting. So what are some of the recommendations for those organizations where they don't have this? What do they need to do? At a basic, you have to have a playbook or a runbook that is developed and known to every relevant stakeholder. Because it's not just enough to have a crisis communications people like what is the tweet you craft, but what is the tweet you craft when something takes into account a range of different interests in the company? What do you do when, again, law enforcement comes to you with information about a breach mm -hmm. or you get that middle of the night uh, email from Brian Krebs that says, oh, guess what I found right. available for sale on the dark web, which is, happens quite frequently. And you'd imagine like, people don't know how to reply to Brian Krebs, right? So if you don't have that, yeah. if you don't have that nailed down, you're way behind. So uh, uh, practice your run book, practice your playbook, because it's not just for that actual crisis. It actually builds shared consciousness around the problem set. Mm. It builds trust generally. And it's better for your organization having done the test than not having done the test. So you don't do it just in case that thing happens. You do it because it has benefits beyond just mm. that specific crisis. Um, but most organizations, it's a preventative activity, hard to demonstrate ROI, so it's the first thing that gets cut. Right. Or you get one hour every six months, maybe. Mm at a tabletop exercise right. with board members, it. and it's just forgotten. I, I think a really good example of this is uh, the Boeing 737 MAX incident, right? Because they mishandled this thing from day one. They could have done a way better job, similar to what Johnson Johnson did way back in the day with the Tylenol scare, yeah. right? Um, and we, again, these are articles we've covered from a leadership communication perspective because I think they're interesting stories to understand. So when something goes wrong, how do you react and respond to it and build confidence and trust back to your customers or whoever that, yes, all right, something happened. We're going to pull the planes off. We're going to check out everything out, make sure everything's okay, maybe do a software update and get them back on. But they didn't do that, right? right? They misstepped all these different places and then... All, then they decided, oh, we should pull the planes and, and redo this. They lost so much credibility by doing that because they weren't prepared for that kind of incident. But they also weren't honest about what they knew and didn't know. Mm. One of the best examples of this I've ever seen, if you've ever seen the Merck CEO, when, um, I'm sorry, Maersk, Maersk, the shipping company. Oh, yeah, the shipping Maersk company, yeah, the container when company. They got, when they got hit with ransomware, Maersk sent, the CEO sent out one statement to all employees, make sure customer needs are met, no matter what, we'll accept the cost. Hmm. Period. That was like in the military they call commander's intent. This was the simple message that everyone knew and could repeat and drove behavior down to the lowest level of execution. Right. And so they didn't claim they knew what they didn't know. They didn't know the scope of the attack. They didn't know if they had it contained. They didn't know when the system would be clean. And so they just said, keep doing what you're doing because that matters more than anything else. And they lost a ton of money, mm -hmm. but they didn't lose credibility. And they didn't lose customers. They actually gained customers because when it came down to it, they were willing to absorb the costs rather than transfer them on to their customers. Yeah, which is great, great ancillary to the previous story because, uh, you know, the Boeing one sticks out in my mind as just, just really, really mishandled. Yeah. All right, we've got a couple books. Please. So I've got to get my, my, my book stash out. So the first one is Red Team, How to Succeed by Thinking Like the Enemy. So this goes right into the discussion we just had, you know, kind of the non-cyber the, the non red teaming kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of that, but it's also why you need to red team, which is, mm. uh, again, organizations are systematically incapable of identifying their blind spots, challenging their assumptions, knowing their vulnerabilities. That's true in the cyber world. That's also true yeah. in everything organizations do. You can't grade your own homework. You have to have an independent, semi-disinterested individual or team which red teams your strategy plans and processes yeah. again. Because on your own, again, you ask me if I'm good looking or smart or charismatic, don't believe me. <laughs> because I have no reason to be honest. I don't know that. People right. are really unself-aware. Same with companies. Got it. Second one, um, clear and present safety. Yeah, so this is an antidote to contemporary fear-mongering about the state of the world, which is if you read cable news, you listen to political leaders, you think things have never been worse. In reality, on every quality of life metric, things have never been better for a greater percentage of people on Earth. Mm -hmm. That's a really positive thing. A lot of this looks at, looks at why that is, how to sustain that as a foreign policy, but it also turns national security on its head and looks at the things that actually harm Americans, which are all domestic, overwhelmingly based upon opioids, car deaths, gun deaths, pedestrian deaths, um, uh, the, the decrease in social mobility. The challenges that the rest of the world are coming out of are getting worse here. And mm. America is becoming, I would say, a less developed, developing country 
relative to their peers very quickly. So instead of thinking about how to protect Americans from threats and risks abroad, we basically look at what actually harms Americans today. And it's us internally. It's us internally. It's all within our borders. And we have evidence-based interventions to improve life and safety and health and well-being here. And we choose not to prioritize it the same way we do overseas. Oh, interesting. Micah, thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. And thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.